My dear brothers and sisters, I bring you grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I forgot to mention, by the way, that that hymn you just sang uh, is from Holden Evening Prayer, and it was just led by Michael and Hillary on the cello and Green on the violin, and they will be leading us on Monday nights, which is why we were singing it this weekend during all of our worship services. So thank you all for joining us. They've got to go now rehearse for the 11 o'clock. Um, I mentioned in my welcome that this is a, a transitional week. I f it isn't always this quick that Advent comes after Thanksgiving, so I feel like we're still sort of getting over Thanksgiving even as we uh, enter into the uh, new church year with the first weekend of Advent. So I want to sort of help us ease into it here as well by focusing, to start at least, on something that we've been seeing a lot of if you've been watching TV uh, this past weekend. What has been, what's, a, what's always on TV a whole lot on Thanksgiving weekend? Footballs, right. So do we have any college football fans in the house today? All right. And by the way, speaking of football, a shout out to Alex Fisher, who goes to Benilde St. Margaret. They just won state for the, is it the very first time ever? So, first time. So, well done. Congratulations to Alex. <clears throat> Was anyone else here on that team? All right, good. So, I want to talk about uh, an event, again, easing us from Thanksgiving and college football into Advent eventually here. Um, and no, my sermon is not going to be 25 minutes long. And thank you for all not walking out when Kathy mentioned that. Um, does anyone know what the Iron Bowl is? Okay, that's right, Auburn versus Alabama, the University of Alabama, Crimson Tide versus the Auburn Tigers. That is one of those sort of historic uh, fights, battles between two colleges that goes way back. It started in 1893. Um, it was just played yesterday, Auburn, no, excuse, excuse me, Alabama, which is ranked number one, beat Auburn this year. A more, another bit of trivia about that uh, contest. Does anyone know what happened in the 1982 playing of that bowl? They, again, they call it the Iron Bowl. It's not a bowl in the modern sense, but anyone know? Yes. Oh. Uh, that, I don't, he said that's when the trees at Alabama were poisoned by an Auburn fan, or the other way around. That may also be the case. That is not what I'm thinking about. <laughs> um, so in 1982, Bo Jackson, does anyone remember Bo Jackson, who played for Auburn, he won the game um, with an amazing play uh, where he went over the line. In fact, it is such a famous play. I'm not kidding this. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a page devoted to Bo over the top because of that play. And they won. But in order to understand the significance of that victory in that play, you have to understand first what preceded it. So again, the, the, this contest has been uh, run since 1893. And in 1982, again, the year that Auburn finally won, they had lost that game nine years running. The prior year, 1981, they almost won. They were ahead with two minutes to go. And in the last two minutes, the Crimson Tide scored not one, but two touchdowns to beat them. And in doing so, Bear Bryant, who was Alabama's coach, became at that time the winningest college coach of all Time. So in 1982, uh, you can imagine if you're Auburn, you are not feeling very good about your chances, right? You've lost nine straight, and now you're going up against this coach who has got this sort of mythic, uh, fi is this mi mythic figure in Alabama. And sure enough, fourth quarter comes around in the 1982 game, and Auburn is down. Things are playing out according to script. Alabama is forced to punt with about seven minutes left. Auburn recovers or gets the ball at the 33-yard line. They make an amazing drive down the field. It's very exciting. And they get down to the half-yard line. They're, they have 18 inches to go. There's two minutes left, but time is not an issue because at this point it is fourth down. And they're down, by the way, 17 to 22. So either they win or either they score or they're going to lose the game. 
So at that point, again, it's fourth down, they call a timeout. They're 18 inches away. Bo Jackson, and again, you guys remember Bo, I mean, he was amazing. And he was a true freshman, by the way, that year. He goes to the coach, uh, Pat Dye was his name, and he says, hey, coach, in high school, I was a high jumper and I could jump seven feet, which was true. So why don't we, rather than try to punch the ball through the line, why don't I just jump over the line, which is what they do. Bo scores the, 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 the touchdown and becomes sort of a famous thing, as I mentioned about Wikipedia, and they win the game. Now, why do I share that story today, the first Sunday of Advent? Not because of the touchdown so much, and not because they won the game, but because of something that the coach from Auburn said years later. Again, Pat Dye is his name. And what he said is, you know, in my opinion, that play by Bo Jackson and that victory was the most important moment in the history of Auburn football. For this reason, he said, with that touchdown, with that victory, Bo Jackson gave the people of Auburn the single greatest gift anyone can give to a group of people. He gave them hope. He gave them hope that they would not always be losers. He gave them hope that the future was bright and filled with promise. He gave them hope that they might go on, in fact, to win games in the future. Now, did you see what I just did there? Because what's one of the major themes of Advent? That's right. Nice, huh? <laughs> and that's why we read uh, that reading from Isaiah. We read from the second chapter of the book of Isaiah, which is one of many places. Isaiah is filled with beautiful imagery of hope. Um, I'll get to the second chapter in a second, but just as you have to understand the context of what became, came before that victory in 1982 for Auburn to understand the significance and importance of that play in that victory, so you have to understand what comes before the second chapter of Isaiah to understand its power. So in the very first chapter of Isaiah, some of you may know this, Isaiah, speaking on behalf of God, says uh, the following. This is the very, it's the second verse, actually. There's an introductory first verse. But the second verse, here's what Isaiah says on behalf of God to the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. And it goes downhill from there. Isaiah gives it to the people of Jerusalem and Judah with a double barrel. He says, hey folks, you have forgotten who you are. You have forgotten who your God is. You are worshiping idols. You are not paying attention to the lost and the least and the left behind. You're not paying attention to the orphans and widows. You have become self-centered and selfish. And I, your God, am disappointed in you. I am frustrated with you. And I am angry. Right? So these people, the people of Jerusalem and Judah, the, who are listening at least to Isaiah, say they, they recognize they're not in a good place, sort of like Auburn in those years leading up to 1982. And then in chapter 2, Isaiah changes his tone drastically. He completely shifts the tone from one of sort of attack and of beating up on the people to a different kind of tone. And here's the first verse of chapter 2 that we heard read today. Here's what it says. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. The word that Isaiah saw. Which is a way of saying, this is the word that Isaiah imagined, and therefore God imagined for God's people. This is the word that Isaiah envisioned. This is the word that Isaiah believed the people of Jerusalem and Judah could be. He believed they could be a people who remembered who they were. He believed they could be a people who understood once again what justice and righteousness were. He believed they could be a people focused on goodness and truth and beauty rather than on themselves. He believed they could be a people focused on peace rather than war, which is why the end of that chapter has that beautiful line about beating um, swords into plowshares, which is, by the way, the panel for Isaiah on the back wall is precisely that, turning the weapons of war into instruments of peace. So what Isaiah does for the people of Jerusalem and Judah is he gives them an alternative future. He says, you can be better than this. You have a bright 
future. Now, those of us who are Christian, we read those words, those beautiful, poetic, majestic words of Isaiah, and we are moved by them purely by their poetry. But we are also moved by them because we believe that the Emmanuel, God with us, who Isaiah talks about in other places, has indeed come and lived among us. God has come in the person of Jesus, whose birth we celebrate, of course, in the next four weeks uh, at Christmas. And we believe that thanks to his birth and his life and his witness and his ministry and his death and, yes, his resurrection, everything has changed for us. As Christians, we believe the rules of the game have changed. And we believe that thanks to Jesus' life and, and resurrection, death and resurrection, nothing anymore can separate us from God. Not our own failures, not our own weakness, not our own doubts, not our own securities, not our own illness, not even our own death, we believe, can separate us from God. Which means that we are freed to live this life filled with joy and appropriately this weekend filled with thanksgiving and with gratitude. Now, I don't use sports metaphors very often in my preaching, but I think this one kind of works. If you imagine this life as a football game, then one of the things we're reminded, thanks to Jesus, is that while we're still playing the game, in some mysterious way, we already know how it turns out. We know who wins, and it's God. And we are privileged to play on God's team. Which means we can play this game called life with joy and freedom and thanksgiving. Which, by the way, makes it a lot more fun for us to play. But I'm also convinced that the world is watching us as we play it. Paying attention to how we play it. And I believe that that world looks at us and hopefully thinks to itself, boy... In a world that is filled with darkness, this is a place filled with light. In a world that is filled with rejection, this is a place that's filled with acceptance. In a world that is filled with pain, this is a place that's filled with healing. In a world that is filled with conflict, this is a place that's filled with reconciliation and peace and forgiveness. In a world that's filled with isolation, this is a place that's filled with community. And in a world that is filled with death, this is a place that is filled with resurrection life. In 1982, Bo Jackson gave Auburn University that amazing gift of hope. And that was a beautiful thing. My hunch, though, is that God's dreams are bigger than just Auburn. I believe that God wants to give the world that same kind of amazing, brilliant, joy-filled hope. And as we enter a new church year here, I pray that we, as part of Christ's body, can bring hope to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.